all this talk of concurrency and you're probably wondering, well, how do I start threads in Clojure? And the answer is that you simply use the classes that already exist in Java. For convenience though, Clojure makes its function objects implement the runnable interface, which means that when you start a thread, you can simply pass in a regular Clojure function and that's what the thread will execute. So that's everything about Clojure that I'm going to cover in any detail, but what did I leave out? Well, first of all, a lot of times in Java, the way you use some existing library is that you have to either inherit from some existing class or you are meant to implement some interface. The problem then is how do we use such libraries in Clojure without having to write some Java classes that act as a wrapper? Well, in the standard library, there is this macro called proxy, which allows us basically to derive from Java classes and interfaces in Clojure code. When you use proxy, it's simply up to you to provide the functions which implement the interface methods or override the class methods. Proxy is actually relatively limited. There's some things you can do when you create your own Java wrapper classes that you can't do with proxy. On the other hand, it's suitable for your purposes most of the time. We also sometimes have the problem when interoperating with Java classes that we need Java arrays. We need the ability to create them in Clojure code and to manipulate them. Again, the standard library has functions and macros for doing just that. Type hinting is a feature in some dynamic languages whereby you actually mark in code what the types of, say, parameters are supposed to be. The idea is that these type hints can be used by the compiler to make optimizations. So say if you have some loop in a performance critical section of code, then you might consider optimizing it by using type hints. A very similar related idea is that you can put hints in your code such that computations deal with primitives rather than the normal boxed number types. Destructuring is a convenience feature that's used in the parameter lists of functions and in the name value lists of let forms. The inconvenience which destructuring addresses is that when we have some collection, we typically very often want to pull out individual members and deal with just those members. So say I have some function parameter where it's expected to receive some vector, and what I want to do with that vector at the start of the function is first extract the third item and assign it to some name, let's say x, and extract, say, oh, the, the seventh item and assign it to some name y. Without destructuring, the way I would do this is that I would start my function with a let and I would introduce the names x and y and each one would be assigned the value returned by the operation which takes from a vector some particular item. With destructuring, however, we can put the business of that let simply into the parameter list itself in a more syntactically compact way. Similarly, it's common to have a let where you have some collection and you want to take out individual items from that collection and bind them to names in the let. Well, the let form supports this destructuring convenience, so you can do that in a syntactically compact way. Vars have a feature whereby for the temporary duration of a scope, they can be given a new value. So for the duration of such a scope, the var has a temporary value, but then when execution leaves the scope, the var has the value it had before the scope was entered. The really special part about this binding, though, is that it is only seen in that thread. These temporary bindings are said to be thread local, whereas the real value of the var is called its root binding. It's the root binding of a var that we set when we use def. So every thread normally sees the root binding of a var, but when a thread enters one of these special scopes, the thread then sees its own particular binding for that var, for the duration of that scope. So what can you do with these thread local bindings? Well, one thing you could do is use a var as basically a mutable local variable. Now, of course, doing this wouldn't be properly functional, but on the other hand, there just are some algorithms that for the sake of efficiency, do really rely on having some mutating local data. Another thing that these thread local bindings allow is, let's say we have some existing piece of code that calls this function that does logging, and this logging is done at multiple points throughout the code. Well, if you wanted to change this logging behavior, what you can always do in Clojure is to replace the existing logging function with a new one by simply assigning a replacement into the var, but what if you want the effect of this change to be limited to just one isolated place? You don't want to affect all logging throughout the program, you just want to affect it, say, for the duration of when you call such and such function. 
So what you can do then is you can wrap such and such call in one of these special scopes where we create a thread local binding for the login function. And so the change is temporary and restricted to just one part of the program. So that's everything that I'm going to say about Clojure. What I suggest you do next is you first watch the screencast that Rich Hickey gives called Clojure for Java Programmers. Then if you go to the Clojure.org website and you look on the left, you'll see a sidebar and that's all of the documentation that Rich Hickey has written and I strongly suggest you read that. And then if you have further questions, you should go to the Google Groups for Clojure, which is the main place where you're going to find a discussion about the language.